Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 10 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Parvez Ahmed. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this for our 10th episode, so that's got to be some kind of anniversary. It's, it's, the, it's the tinfoil anniversary. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but no, we, we really, uh, I, I also wanted to say that uh, I, 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 I've been feeling pretty bad about the fact that we, we are late once again. Again, not by design. We were with some difficulty in trying to schedule our guest. Uh, but I hope that, uh, that, that uh, our conversation today makes up for that. Well, and and to that point, I mean, we, we've got a pretty awesome guest. Uh, we're joined this month by Shadi Hamid, who is, uh, he has, has a resume that's, that's pretty impressive. He's a fellow with the Project on U.S. Relations with the Islamic World in the Center for Middle East Policy. He's author of Temptations of Power, Islamists and Illiberal Democracy in a New Middle East. He served as Director of Research at the Brookings Doha Center until January of 14. And prior to joining Brookings, Hamid was Director of Research Research at the Project on Middle East Democracy, also known as POMED, and a Hewlett Fellow at Stanford University Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. He's currently Vice Chair of POMED, a member of the World Bank's MENA Advisory Panel, and a contributing writer for The Atlantic. So all of that means he's much, much smarter than me. So uh, <laughs> And me, right. And, <laughs> and we're very grateful to have him join us because the last month, if anybody's been paying attention, has been a very busy one in terms of uh, uh, things that have been happening in the Middle East. So, so uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have you on, uh, Shadi. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to sort of go into the discussion, as, as Zaki alluded to. Obviously, we have a lot of ground to cover, uh, and I think, and, and I, I really felt that you'd be the absolutely, pers- you know, the, the perfect person to engage in this conversation about all the sort of things that are happening uh, in the Middle East. But uh, if you could, you know, just sort of briefly talk about, you know, what drew you, uh, obviously, perhaps your own background, but, um, you know, what drew you to studying the region and, 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 and sort of what, what where some of your travels took you? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, there's a lot there. Let's see where we can start. Well, you know, I, I, was, I was fascinated for a long time with this question of why we weren't doing more to support democracy in the Middle East. So after 9-11, when we were, you know, thinking about the root causes, um, I think a big part of it, at least in my own mind, was the kind of political dysfunction, the lack of democracy, the fact that these authoritarian regimes had been in power for so long and that that created an environment conducive to extremism, political violence and terrorism. So one of the questions was why, you know, why aren't we doing more to support democracy? And the answer to that was at least in part that we were worried about Islamist parties coming to power um, so we wanted democracy in theory, but we weren't totally comfortable with the outcomes in practice. So I wanted to understand who these Islamist groups were and and really immerse myself in their world. What were their objectives? What animates them? What is their vision of the Islamic State? Do they really believe in the Islamic State? Um, and so on. So I... I um, I was living in Jordan in 2004, 2005, um, and I spent about nine months, uh, you know, uh, conducting research on the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood. And here I was, a kind of naive graduate student, and I remember at that time, no one really cared much about uh, about Jordan, but even when it came to Islamist movements, um, it still wasn't a very hot topic as it is today. Um, and I was actually the only American researcher living in Amman who was focusing on the Jordanian Brotherhood. And they were a little bit, I think, um, maybe confused at first because I would go to their headquarters and I would hang out in their archives room. And I would just kind of read a lot of documents, do a lot of interviews. And they must have been thinking to them, 
thinking to themselves, you know, why does this guy care about us so much? <laughs> right, right. So my basic philosophy when it comes to, you know, studying, understanding, and writing about Islamist movements is that you have to get to know them on a personal level. Um, these are people. They they have fears. They have aspirations. Um, they struggle to deal with a variety of issues in both politics and religion. And it just worries me sometimes that in Washington and, and just more generally in the U.S., we have a lot of people talking about groups like the Muslim Brotherhood but haven't actually spent time with a live Muslim Brotherhood member. So I think like at, at the most at the most basic level, you know, you have to you have to talk to them. Um, I know it sounds so self-evident and so obvious, oh. but that that <laughs> I don't know. I no, um, I think I, I think our I, you know, I, I think just the for you know, like the sort of the uh, uh, just America's involvement in the region, if it proves anything, it proves that point exactly that even though those things may be self-evident, uh, unfortunately, something as basic as that. Uh, has not been an approach we've taken, um, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. leading leading up to even the Iraq War, you know, uh, we had people in the administration not understanding the basic differences between Shia and Sunni, you know, movements or, or sorry, Shia right. and Sunni Muslims. So, um, but but Shadi, if, if we could, you know, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, and it's very relevant to what you've just been sort of saying about, you know, you know, uh, here we are talking about the Muslim Brotherhood without even having engaged. You know, really, with a, a live Muslim Brotherhood member, but but um, and when I say we, as I mean we as an Americans. Um, if you could, though, you know, just sort of you know, as we delve into the region when we when we're talking about the Middle East, uh, to talk perhaps a little bit about the fact that, or if in your view you agree with this assessment, that we're not talking about a. Um, a, a, a monolithic uh, a region of the world, right? This is this by no means is a monolith, and we often talk about the Middle East as if it's this uh, abstract or this or this uh, artificial construction, um, and not realizing that we're in fact perhaps uh, talking about uh, uh, you know a, a very fractitious uh, kind of part of the world. Uh, so if you could kind of talk about that and give us kind of an idea of when we do talk about the Middle East, you know what are what are those different you know sort of cleavages and fractions that we're talking about? Sure. Well, I mean, yes, I mean, you can kind of um, understanding the, the basic local context in each of these countries is absolutely critical. And obviously, we, we always have to be careful about generalizing um, when you have so much diversity in the region. That said, I think we can also look at general trends and commonalities across cases. And, you know, as a political scientist, we're that's 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 part of what we try to do is to look at specific cases, but then to kind of generalize beyond those those specifics. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think there are I think especially now you're looking at um, everything is is intertwined. So if we're trying to understand the conflict in Gaza between Hamas and Israel, we also have to understand the role of Qatar and Turkey, which are supporters of Hamas. And on the other side of that, we have to understand the role of Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which are, let's say, in the kind of um, the so-called moderate pro-stability axis. I mean, moderate is obviously not the right word, but that's how it's often referred to in, in the American media and elsewhere. So you have you have this kind of Middle East Cold War and a lot of the local conflicts seem localized at first. But when you actually look at them. There's so many different actors meddling and interfering, and what you really end up seeing is a bunch of regional proxy battles. So mm -hmm. we see that in Israel-Palestine. We see that in Libya. I mean, just, just this past week, there have been reports that the UAE and Egypt have launched airstrikes in Libya against Islamist militias. In Lib right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, didn't, and the interesting part of this, um, according to the new... Uh, according to, to various reports, is that the U.S. was not informed beforehand, which I think says something about the kind of disrespect our own allies have for us and, and to say nothing of our enemies. So, um, so I think that, that the regional proxy battle side is, is very relevant here. But, but I think if we're looking at cleavages and divisions, the foundational cleavage 
um, in in so many of these these countries is about is about the role of religion in public life, and we can say that it's between Islamists on one hand and secularists on the other, or liberals, or non-Islamists, or anti-Islamists, whatever we want to call them, and, and it differs a little bit um, from country to country. But that that's what we've seen now in, in Egypt, um, Tunisia, uh, Syria to some extent. In Syria, obviously, there are sectarian divides as well, as well and ethnic divides. The same goes for Iraq. Um, and... Uh, so this kind of question of what is what is the nation state, um, what is the identity of the state, uh, what is the purpose of the nation state? So we have a basic lack of consensus throughout the Middle East about something which is so basic. And that's why I think we're seeing this eruption of conflict mm-hmm. and why it's so visceral and oftentimes so vicious, where even in relatively homogenous countries like Egypt, citizens are turning against each other like never before. So Egypt, we thought, was somewhat immune to the specter of civil conflict um, because it's 90% Sunni Muslim, because there is a sense of Egyptianness, a common, a common sense of, of the Egyptian nation, let's say. But even with those advantages, we've seen Egyptians turning against each other. And what we saw last August 14th, was was very shocking. We saw what Human Rights Watch calls the worst mass killing in modern Egyptian history, where more than 800 people were killed in mere hours. So You're we really have the, to come about the, the Rabat massacre. The Rabat massacre, exactly. right, exactly. Right. So that, that forces us to kind of ask some uncomfortable questions. How do people who claim to believe in the democratic process just three years ago, and they were unified together in Tahrir Square when they were ousting Mubarak, how do we go from that peak, that level of, of optimism, to what we had last August? It's a very short period of time. Correct. So, and I think that's also what's frustrating a lot of Americans is with how you had the optimism of the Arab Spring, but now you have essentially, to put it, I, I suppose, bluntly, is Arabs and Muslims killing each other. So that's a challenge to kind of make sense of that. And I think the only way we can really understand it is you have the removal of these autocratic regimes in countries like like Egypt, um, you have Libya. Egypt, Libya, Yemen, um, Syria, at least in parts of the country. Correct. And when you remove that those repressive those repressive pressures, those the sentiments that people weren't able to express can now finally be expressed, whether those are ethnic identities, sectarian, religious, or ideological. So democracy actually, ironically enough, or let's say democratization more accurately, actually allows these sentiments to come to, come to the surface, really, in a way. Um, now, we saw this play out, you know, in the aftermath of the uh, of the Iraq war, right? When we ousted Saddam, you know, all of those, like you're saying, those, those things that were sort of beneath the preserves, uh, or perhaps really never really beneath the surface, but certainly beyond this, um, this, uh, the, you know, w- w- you know, beyond just Saddam in power and the Ba'athists in power, um, you know, when, when you have that, when you remove that, um, uh, you suddenly had all those fractions come, you know, and play out. Precisely, precisely. Yes. And, um, so I think that we were, you know, at, you know, as political scientists, I suppose more generally, I think Americans, I think we were spoiled because we were thinking about the transitions in Eastern Europe or maybe even Latin America, which were challenging and difficult as all democratic transitions are. But there was a general positive trajectory. But I, I think that if we look at the Arab transitions, they're fundamentally different because of this foundational cleavage regarding the nature of the state and the role of religion in public life. So Mm -hmm. in, um, in, in Eastern Europe, there was a basic consensus that they wanted to move away from state control of the economy, communism, socialism, whatever, you, you know, whatever it happens to be in each case. And so there, so you had a, you had a general consensus in Latin America, the fundamental cleavage in the 19, 
in say the 1960s and, and 70s going into the 80s was over economic issues. So you had socialists on one hand and then right wing neoliberals or, or right wing conservatives on, on the other side of the spectrum. When it comes to economic issues, you can have a discussion about that because it's quantifiable. It's tangible. You can split the middle on economic issues. So the opposition, the socialist opposition could reassure regime elites and tell them, look, your material interests will be protected and they can work out some kind of arrangement, at least in the interim period. But how do you split the middle on religion and ideology? And it's, it almost goes beyond that in a way when you're talking about the very identity of the state. And that was actually one of that kept on coming up in the debate over the debate in Egypt, the identity of the state that right. Islamists were coming to power and the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to change the identity of the state. Now, when you ask people, what do you really mean by the identity of the state? It became a little bit vague and unclear, but it, it, it was almost a kind of metaphysical thing, you know, um, and it was a fear. It was a fear of something that hadn't happened yet. It was a fear that if the Muslim Brotherhood stayed in power, they would use their their influence and their control of the state apparatus to slowly but irrevocably change Egypt as as many Egyptians knew it. And this was particularly true for the secular elite. They had grown up with a particular conception of Egypt. Egypt to them meant something very specific. And now they were seeing that slowly being taken away from them. And I remember I, there was, there's one conversation that I had to this effect. It was right after the, the first post barbaric parliamentary elections in, um, in late 2011. And after the results came out, and it was remarkable that 28, that Salafis, um, so, you know, all, you know, ultra conservative Islamists, not just, you know, not just your, your normal, your normal Muslim Brotherhood type Islamists had won 28 percent of the popular vote. So I was talking to um, a secular, a secular friend um, and she said, you know, essentially, Shadi, I don't recognize my country anymore. I did not know this was happening mm. I didn't know that Salafis could win 28 percent of the popular vote. Do I even know my own people? Do I know Egyptians? So when you have this, like, you you have you, you different Egypts are essentially competing with each other. Right, right. Um, you know, and and you know, I didn't intend to uh, sort of talk about Egypt first, but I think it's a great starting point. Um, you know, when we when, when we if we go back and look at the election of Morsi, right, something you were just talking about uh, just, you know, just moments ago. Um, so who, who are the who are the major players? Right. I mean, we've sort of identified the fact that you had the Salafists. Right. The, 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 and then uh, which were which are distinct from and you drew that distinction from them uh, versus the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan. Um, but were, were there also a sort of liberal elites, obviously involved, Mubarak supporters? Sorry, involved in in the election. Sorry, were they playing like I mean, and, and I mean in terms of actually having a a, a, a political rep, you know political representation. Yeah, sure. I mean, liberal various liberal parties did compete, but they okay. did they did they didn't do well at all. They right, actually, right. They right. they um like no one had really high expectations for them, but in some ways they did even worse than the low expectations that were set for them. So, right. I mean, altogether, um, various Islamist parties won almost 75 percent of the popular vote. Wow. So when we talk about when you, when you say various Islamists and, and I, I want to, you know, I, I'd really like to sort of delve into that a little bit here. We're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, specifically in the context of Egypt, we're talking about the Ikhwan and we're talking about the Salafis, right? Yeah, but even there, who else? There's even distinctions within the the Salafi movement in Egypt. So you had the you had um, the Noor Party, the Asala Party. You had um, Gama Islamiyah, which is technically not a Salafi group per se, but is is um, is definitely on the right flank. Correct. Um, now, Gama Islamiyah, these are the folks. I mean, these the, these are the guys behind the assassination of Sadat, right? Yes, they were formerly yeah. a terrorist group in the 1980s and 90s. Right. And in a in a kind of set of revisions, many of their leaders were in prison um, yeah. until the 2000s, and they released 
um, kind of uh, ideological revisions, I guess would be the way to describe it, where they renounce yeah. violence. And I, I read some of that. I, I know. Uh, I, in fact, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Sherman Jackson. He's actually, sure, uh, you know, yeah. presently working on a translation of some of that stuff. Oh, yeah. okay, interesting, fascinating. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he, that's sort of his uh, one of his uh, present projects. Uh, anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that's the thing that what democracy or what the advent of of democracy and the opening of political space means is that the Muslim Brotherhood no longer has a monopoly on the Islamist vote because parties can form. And you see a proliferation, not just of parties writ large, but Islamist parties. So the Brotherhood finds itself no longer alone in the field, and they have to say, well, oh, we, we have to compete with these groups that claim to be more Islamist than we are, and they claim to be the true purveyors of Islam and political Islam. Mm. So what you end up having there is a kind of religious outbidding. And that's actually one of the reasons I think Egypt moved towards failure because that kind of dynamic was very conducive to polarization, where if we compare to, say, Tunisia, Salafis were much weaker. So you had the dominant Islamist party there in Nahda. They had to actually move to the center because the largest the other the other large parties were largely secular or liberal but in egypt the the second largest party was salafi so they had to kind of um they were dragged further to the right and that's something that i talk about in my book temptations of power i call that the tea party effect right the far the far right drags the center right further rightward so the muslim brotherhood always had to be worried about its right flank um, and they were very sensitive to that to that threat from from the from the Salafis, um, because the Brotherhood was always used to being seen as the only Islamist game in town. If you believed in Islam playing a larger role in political life, you went to the Brotherhood. But now you had all these other options. So that that was threatening to them. That's right. So, so anyway, I mean, obviously, the final outcome being Morsi wins the election, uh, right? In terms of, and then, and then, and the Muslim Brotherhood has won how many? Like, what was the percentage of the, of the seats? They won uh, about forty forty two percent. Right, right. So now, obviously, I mean, if, for anyone who knows the history of Egypt and certainly of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, we know this is like 70 years in the making, right? I mean, they, this is something that, that, the, that, that the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan, has aspired for for 70 plus years, right? So finally now it's come to fruition, uh, doesn't even last a year. <laughs> could, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, like, wh- wh- what happens there? So, so, I mean, first of all, at a very basic level, they weren't prepared. But I suppose you could say, well, was anyone really prepared? I mean, the Brotherhood in particular had spent 80 years in opposition. And they had that that was their basic default position. And now you're telling them, look, not only are you uh, not only are you in power, you're in power in a country as messy, unwieldy and corrupt as Egypt that has a military institution which is afraid of real democracy and wants to actually forestall that possibility. So, I mean, they were kind of, um, they were thrust into a very challenging position. And that's, that's, that's why many warned them and said, be careful. Do you really want to run for the presidency? Is that the right move now? And that's actually one of the reasons that I called the book Temptations of Power because it's funny, you know, if you um, if you look at what Muslim Brotherhood leaders were saying before the Arab Spring, they were very cautious, very careful. They weren't in a rush because they knew that power was dangerous. It could be dangerous. It would be dangerous. And actually, um, uh, you know, I, I, I got to know Mohammed Morsi, who obviously would later become the first Democrat elected president of Egypt, I got to know him a little bit before he became president. And when I first met met him in 2010, it's funny to think back to it because no one would have ever dreamed that this guy would become president of Egypt. He wouldn't have dreamed of it either. I mean, at that time, he was a leader, but he wasn't he wasn't recognized as someone particularly interesting or innovative. He was kind of... Um, 
a brotherhood apparatchik. You know, mm. he wasn't the guy that you went to if you wanted to hear about the vision of the Muslim Brotherhood and what they were really thinking in the medium to long term. No, he wasn't the guy for that. Shadi, so, I'm sorry. I, I, real quick, I, because I, 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 I wanted to say this at the outset, but um, I think for a lot of our listeners, and, and certainly I think those who are primarily informed by just what they you know, listen to or hear uh, in the media, um, you know, could you give us, and this is an impossible task, I know, but maybe like a two-minute like just a primer on the Muslim Brotherhood. Like, what are we talking about? Because, I, you know, a lot of people just sort of hear Muslim Brotherhood and they automatically associate it with either Hamas or, you know, various manifestations or perhaps simply for some, sadly enough, just Muslim Brotherhood means terrorist organization. So if you could just maybe give us a, 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 a you know, a, a real like sort of a two minute primer and then kind of like to go into right what you were talking about with regards to Morsi, um, is the Muslim Brotherhood still sort of hierarchical as it perhaps was, you know, in its founding days? I mean, so, you know, where does Morsi fit in vis-a-vis like the time when you meet him and things like that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but I just, no, no, that's I think, a very, yeah, that's, it's very important. So, yeah, I guess. well, it, it's hard to sum up. <laughs> it might be hard <laughs> to sum up in two minutes, but the basics are pretty much, Right. The Brotherhood was founded in 1928, and, and it's, the, it's the mother of all Islamist movements. Correct. So any Islamist group can kind of track its lineage back to that founding moment, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was a split in the, within the Muslim Brotherhood um, where, you had, where you had some members uh, and supporters who went in a more extreme direction, um, starting in the 1950s and 60s, and then we see the rise of Islamic extremism in the 1970s in places like Egypt. Anyway, the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood um, is a mass movement, mm-hmm. and that's worth emphasizing because many of the more extreme groups today are vanguard movements. And this is a very key distinction when we're trying to understand the orientation of various Islamist groups. So the Brotherhood believes in bottom-up Islamization. So preaching and dawah in, in Arabic mm-hmm. plays a very important role. And that's what the founder of the Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna, was doing in the 1920s and 30s. He was going around and talking to ordinary Egyptians. And Correct. I mean, it sort of begins in the cafeterias and tea houses and coffee houses. Yeah. And, and he's a school teacher. You know, he's, he's not a... a teacher, yeah. Right. He's not, a, he's not an imam, quote-unquote. He's not a religious, you know... Uh, leader by any means, but simply an activist. Exactly, exactly. Right, and a very right. charismatic one. So Certainly. The, the, way the bro- so the way the Brotherhood came to be is a lot of people found his message appealing. And then the idea is that when you start to change individuals and you know, change their, their hearts and minds, if you will, that's, that's the kind of foundation. And then when you have enough is- Islamically oriented individuals – then they start to have Islamically oriented families. When you have enough Islamically oriented families, right. that leads to an Islamically oriented society. Right. And then the final stage of that, if, um, so in a very kind of natural process, is if, if government is reflective of the sentiments of its own people, if enough people are religious and believe in this message, then government is going to have to reflect that. So that's why the Brotherhood has always been known for its kind of slow-moving, gradualist nature. Um, They're not looking to seize power quickly in a kind of surgical appropriation of the state. Um, So they were willing to wait 80 years. And uh, if if you talk to them a few months before the Arab Spring began, they didn't have a plan. They had no idea this was going to happen. Right. They were actually reconciling themselves to the likely possibility that they would be in the wilderness for a very long time. The Mubarak regime was getting more oppressive, and they said, you know, well, we'll be patient. You know, Correct, we'll and wait. I think it's also worth noting, and I think you, you, you did touch on this earlier, you know, so Hassan al-Banna is assassinated. He doesn't die a natural death. So certainly there was a state crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood that became a sort of a threat to the political establishment. And, and you know, I would submit, at least in my reading, and, and please, you know, obviously agree or disagree or add your own thoughts, is that, you know, when you do have the state crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood, is that's when you begin to see the sort of fractions that develop within the Muslim Brotherhood, right, in terms of people who 
were jailed and imprisoned, the, the, you know, they become what would eventually become the Gama al Islamiya and your Zawahiris of the world come from that milieu. And then you had, you know, the, the another sort of extreme fraction, you know, faction being the sort of secular elite. The, you know, liberal, you know, very, very liberal, secular wing of the of the Muslim Brotherhood emerges emerges. So, is that a correct reading of what happens post sort of state, you know, crackdown and arrest and so on of the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's worth mentioning for sure. So, um, there was there was a major devastating crackdown on the Brotherhood starting in the early 1950s and, right. and coming to a head in the in the mid 1950s. Um, under Gamal Abdel Nasser, mm-hmm. and it was interesting because Gamal Abdel Nasser later came to be known as, you know, um, a secular nationalist. But um, Gamal Abdel Nasser was actually a member of the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1940s. But eventually, right. um, there was a parting, a parting of ways, and they actually worked together um, during the 1952 revolution. The Brotherhood supported that revolution was very optimistic at first that someone who they had supported, um, Gamal Abdel Nasser and the other so-called free officers, um, these kinds of um, military defectors, um, you know, were now going to be in power. Uh, so that crackdown happened. And actually, you know, um, not to kind of overstate it, but we can say um, to at least to a degree that modern extremism was born in the prisons of Nasser. That's right. That's right. Because, I mean, here we're also talking about, you know, uh, not, I, I mean, I mentioned the Wahiri, who is really small time when it comes to someone like, say, Sayyid Qutb, for example. Right? Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> so Sayyid say Qutb was one of the, um, was actually the primary ideologue of the Brotherhood um, during that period in the 1950s. He was right. imprisoned. And, for him, prison was a very, um, it was a radicalizing experience. And one of the questions that many Brotherhood members were asking themselves in prison was, so they were, um, they were being tortured, some executed. So the, the question then was raised, how can our fellow Egyptians, so these are Egyptian soldiers, Muslim Egyptian soldiers, how can our fellow Muslims kill us in cold blood? How can they kind of come into a prison room and torture us so brutally? So they, they, that, that mm-hmm. was the question. And one of the answers was that perhaps they weren't Muslim, that they had, in a sense, disavowed their own Islam through their actions. And this is where the, the notion of takfir comes into prominence, this idea that people who are Muslim um, who are born Muslim or even practice, you know, they are Muslims in their lives. If they don't kind of um, live up to certain Islamic standards and a certain commitment to Islamic law um, and so on and so forth, they essentially, um, their blood becomes licit so they can therefore be killed. So that's, so the idea of takfir then um, emerges from that. So, um, so I mean, that's a one fan- of the- Perhaps yes. a fancier term is uh, anathematized, right? Where yeah. where someone is like sort of quote unquote excommunicated or anathematized from the larger group. Exactly, exactly. And this is this is the kind of principle that 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 is central to groups like ISIS right now. And we can get to that later. But briefly, yes. I mean, I mean, the most of the people ISIS kills are Muslim. So I mean, they're so so. Um, but ISIS would say that many, if not most of them, are not actually Muslim. So a anyway, similar but, argument but, made by Al Qaeda, you know, exactly any, any of these were, extremist yeah, groups, correct, exactly. Correct, correct. But just to go back to, to yeah, um, Egypt and the, the brother. So you have this kind of split within the Brotherhood, where the um, the followers of Qutb in the 1970s move in a particular direction, away from the mainstream of the Brotherhood. Now, the, the Brotherhood renounced violence um, in the 1970s, and then starting in the 1980s, they enter the parliamentary process, and they come to terms with democracy, um, especially in the 1990s. And you see an evolution, because initially, the Brotherhood would say that um, democracy was a foreign import, and that the only way to rule was by having someone of correct Islamic character, not through election, but through selection, 
Um, so you do see a major evolution ideologically in accepting what were initially seen to be foreign ideas. But that's the, one of the key divides now, and this is why, you know, when I talk about the Brotherhood, I, I would kind of call them mainstream Islamist groups, meaning that they first renounce, renounce the use of violence and they commit to the democratic process. Now, we can have a debate about how committed they are to the principles of democracy or more specifically liberal democracy, but at, le at the very least, they agree to work within the democratic process to achieve their Islamic aims. And that's very different from groups like um, Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS or, or many of the others that we talk about, which see democracy as evidence of kufr or disbelief. Right. That by accepting democracy, you're accepting at a very basic level that men can make laws, that majorities can go their own way and actually pass legislation that is counter to divine strictures and objectives. That's a great point, because I think that ties directly into what we were talking about earlier in terms of, you know, where, you know, how do these Islamist parties view the nation state? Right. I mean, that becomes very relevant to that conversation. Exactly. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, when you can accept the validity of, quote unquote, like you're saying, man-made law, then 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 the idea of a nation state becomes much more palatable than, say, if you reject that notion entirely, as we see in groups like ISIS and others. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's worth noting, for example, that Amin and Zawahri wrote a whole book. Right. Attacking the Brotherhood for betraying the Islamic cause, uh, I the Muslim Brotherhood's bitter harvest in 60 years, where he details how the Brotherhood lost its way and moved away from the true Islamic path. Many extremists would call would actually accuse the Brotherhood of disbelief that they, too, are are infidels um, because of their um, their acceptance of uh, of, of not of not holding to divine law. Correct. So that's a very that's a very important divide within the very diverse world of political Islam. Right. And I think, you know, one of the I think one of the more unfortunate developments of the past few years post Arab Spring is that well, look, no one has to like the Muslim Brotherhood and it's very, you know, and um you know as Americans, uh you know, we don't share their values, they're deeply conservative, illiberal, um, the list goes on. All of that's all of that's true, but they are they um, we we can't compare the Muslim Brotherhood w to our own standards as Americans because obviously the Brotherhood is not operating in the American political spectrum. So we can't say well they're extreme compared to America's liberal ideals. That would be just a weird way of looking at Islamist groups. We have to understand them in their own context. And situationally speaking, on the political spectrum, the Brotherhood is not extremist mm -hmm. within its own context. I mean, its views about religion and the role of religion in public life are very mainstream, are widely accepted right. by, by the majority of, of the population in, in places like Egypt, at least not, not in every way, but certainly on some of their, um, their key beliefs about the importance of Sharia law and the implementation right. of Sharia law. That's right. So, so, um, so that's I think that that's that's important for Americans to understand. Um, and um, no, and, and I, I'm sorry, I, I just you know for for the for the just for the uh, sake of time, also I, you know I wanted to sort of talk about uh, in that same context since we are talking about Islamist groups, where do the Salafis fit in? I mean, because when I when I for me when I hear or use the expression Salafi, you know, it, it, it for years or for decades they represented a very apolitical. Uh, you know, ideolo ideological movement, um, you know, rooted in in Saudi Arabia. So, so where does that sort of? You know, obviously, the ideology then can you know is exported outside of Saudi Arabia by through the means of petrodollars and so on. And rather than getting to that, all of that, just to talk about the Salafis in particular in in in, in Egypt, if you could. Sure. I mean, well. Um... So there are quietist Salafis who believe in focusing on education and preaching and disavow politics, but increasingly in places like Egypt, there are Salafis who are politically active and form political parties, and that's what we saw after the fall of Mubarak in 2011. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, but the main the main difference is um, the degree of liter- literalism. The Brotherhood and groups like the Brotherhood are quite flexible in their interpretation of Islamic law. In that sense, they are. Um, so they, they have this notion of maslaha or the public interest, and that makes it very easy to instrumentalize religion for political ends or to instru- instrumentalize politics for religious ends, depending on how you view it. But essentially this idea that, um, that certain things may not be the letter of the law, but they are ultimately in the public interest of the Muslim ummah, And so there's a kind of political expediency that can come into the Brotherhood's calculations. So people might accuse them of hypocrisy where they don't stay true to their word on a particular commitment to do something or not do something. And they play hardball. I mean, the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood plays a kind of like Chicago style politics. And that's what alienated um, many of their, their, not just their competitors and adversaries, but also some of their own friends. Um, because they, in some ways, they were too flexible. They were too pragmatic, and people didn't really know what they were really trying to do and what they stood for. And that, that's, I think, always been the fear. If you talk to secularists about groups like the Brotherhood, is that they engage in a double discourse. Fine, they might sound moderate sometimes, but is that hiding um, uh, a kind of hardline Islamist agenda? But we'll only see that once they come to power and then solidify their place in power. So I think that there's that kind of distrust because they don't have a very clear notion of, they're not very theologically grounded. And this is what I was struck by, and, you know, spending 10 years interviewing Islamist leaders throughout, throughout the region, but with a focus on groups like the Brotherhood is they're, they didn't really have a coherent theory of political Islam. I mean, or there, there wasn't, there are Islamic political theorists who they draw on people like um, uh, Tariq al-Bishri and Yusuf al-Qaradawi and, and many others, but they might draw some inspiration, but it's not coherent. And when right. you actually have a discussion about your ideal Islamic state, what does that look like in practice? And you get a lot of different kinds of answers internally within the brotherhood so even when we're talking about a particular organization there is a diversity of perspectives and that's one of the reasons the bro- one of the reasons the brotherhood was always reticent to get into too much detail about their vision of the islamic state first of all because they didn't really know and second if they outlined that in detail that would alienate some of their own members who would say well oh i'm not sure if i'm totally down with this so it's better to keep it vague especially when you're not sure when if ever at least you know that the islamic state will come to be um so that that's one of the real challenges is that's why when they came to power in egypt you know you have these absolute religious ideals but then you have the mundane realities of everyday politics and the compromises and the difficult compromises that entails that there's a, there's a big gap there. So how, how do you square the circle? So I think that Islamists are always going to have real difficulty where you, where do you draw the line on compromise? How far do you go? Um, And obviously different Islamist parties have approaches in different ways. Um, but I, I, just to go back to one of my earlier points, but I think in many ways the brotherhood model has been eclipsed, at least for now. I think it'll come back, but for now, um, their model hasn't been very successful. Um, Muhammad Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood were ousted from power, and they're, they're being repressed or are on the run or are facing, um, are facing real challenges in a number of other countries. So the, groups like ISIS come in or other extremist groups, and they say, look, you saw how the Brotherhood bought into this whole Arab Spring democracy stuff, and look where that got them. Right. And they say this time and time again. The Islamic State cannot come except through arms. And they they believe that they've been vindicated by the events of the Arab Spring, and in particular by the coup against the Muslim Brotherhood last year. Right. So they say, well, you know, um, 
don't worry about this democracy thing. We can, we can get you the Islamic State. We can create the Islamic State right now through brute force. And they've done that in a remarkably successful way. I mean, right. they, um, they govern according to a very strict and, and brutal interpretation of Islamic law in large swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria. So this is not just – and in that sense, they're even different than al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda right. would talk about the caliphate or the Islamic State in theory, but they were never serious about actually doing it. The Islamic State – uh, or ISIS or this or what, what is now what, what they are now the Islamic State. Um, yeah, they Dota actually, Islamia, right? So yeah, yeah, they they actually they did it and they're doing it right. Um, and they're they're regulating every aspect of life in the territory they control. So they're they're dispensing justice through Sharia courts. They're administering local government. Um, they're, they're, um, they have, you know, Hezbollah, so these, these kinds of religious police who go mm -hmm. around the cities and make sure that people are, um, observing Islamic law in public and they're praying and do, and not drinking alcohol and not having alcohol in their homes. So, I mean, this, it's, in that sense, it's, it's much more advanced right. and on a much larger scale than anything we've seen really. In recent yeah. memory, and it's it's funny, and I, well, for one, I mean, I know you're aware of the time, and hence you sort of led the conversation towards ISIS, which is we'd be remiss not to talk about. Um, I, I will say though, Shadi, I think just if anything, our conversation thus far proves that we have to have you on again. Uh, <laughs> I'd love I mean, to. Really, sure. I mean, I, I think that having you on for an hour or hour and a half is just not long enough, uh, especially just given the sort of breadth and scope of experience you have and expertise in the region, and certainly. Uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, the, the events in the Middle East and our relationship to that part of the world is going anywhere. So yeah. I know that having you on at any time again in the near future is always going to be relevant. I'd um, love to. No, no, thank you. But Shadi, so, so talking about ISIS, though, in particular, um, uh, you know, I, I do, I do want to, I do want to mention something that you write about. Um, when, when, when we were talking about Islamist group, you know, movements, you know, to quote you, you know, Islamists cannot truly express their Islamism in a strictly secular state, and asking Islamists to give up their Islamism runs counter to the essence of democracy. I think that we you know a lot of what you talked about you know with regards to the muslim brotherhood and now with isis you know sort of you know vindicating themselves by the events of you know the the the, the coup of the you know of the muslim brotherhood and sisi uh sort of really underscores what 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 do you talk about there yeah exactly so in that article i uh, you know i was referring to this kind of dilemma this tension between liberalism and democracy and we as americans think of those two things as going hand in hand and we have both. So we had the foundations of constitutional liberalism first, and then and only then did we move to democracy. And by that, you know, we mean universal suffrage and full political equality for all citizens. So there was a particular sequencing there. Mm -hmm. But what happens in, in a context like Egypt, where you have a deeply religiously conservative public, majorities who say – they believe in the implementation of Sharia law. So it raises the question, um, do Arabs have the right to decide through the democratic process that they would rather not be liberal? Right, right, right. which you know, was you know, obviously a conversation that happened after Iraq, right? I mean, are, if we're going to celebrate uh, democracy and freedom, then, then, then that has to come without any strings attached. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's and our relationship to democracy vis-a-vis -vis, when I say our, I mean, the American or or Western relationship, uh, you know, may not, you know, it, it may not it, it may not, you know, be the exact same when we see that play out in the Middle East. Certainly. Exactly. Exactly. And I think I think from a kind of political theory standpoint, it's a fascinating question. Do different people's have the right to try out alternative <laughs> ideological projects or. Do they have to choose from a menu, but that menu only comes that only within the confines of liberal democracy right. so, um, or what we might call universal values. But the problem with even that phrase universal values is universal values are not universally held. I mean, if you if, you know, according to pretty much all the polling, we, you know, most of the polling we have, mm 
especially in a country like Egypt, but to various degrees in, in many other Arab countries, you have large majorities who believe in things that run counter to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whether that's on um, minority rights or uh, gender equality um, or even this or what what is the role of the state? Should the state be ideologically neutral or should the state be invested with a mission or with a set of values that the state it's the state's responsibility to do what it can to promote an environment where people can be and should be better Muslim. So, I mean, it raises some very challenging questions about what we as outside observers think, you know, what are we as Americans willing to accept? But of course, it's not really for us to accept. It's for them to do. And then they vote, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately people are going to vote for who they want to vote for. Mm-hmm. But so far, the existing secular state systems um, in the Middle East have not been able to accommodate Islamist participation in the democratic process because of this clash right. um, between different conceptions of the good. Uh, so that, that's, that to, for, you know, when I kind of look at the next you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we're obsessed with ISIS now, but the bigger question is, what is this going to look like? I mean, are Arabs going to be able to come to a consensus about the basic attributes of the modern nation state? Or is this, and perhaps they have to go through a period of violence and civil conflict to finally come to the conclusion that the only real option is to just lift, like figure out a way to, look, people can hate each other, but they have to agree to hate each other within the political process. To me, that's the answer to the problem. But the question is, how long does it take to get there when you say, well, okay, we're going to resolve this through negotiation, through the democratic process, and we're going to respect the outcomes, even if they're counter to our own interests. I mean, how long does it take to get there? And I think the answer to that is probably a long time. So so do you ever, I mean, you know, again, if you want to gaze into that crystal ball, um, you know, what happens to a group like ISIS? I mean, for one, right now, it seems that the State Department's response, um, I can't speak to some of the response from some of the regional players, but but has been to treat, uh, you know, the threat of ISIS or the, I'm sorry, the expanse of ISIS, uh, you know, sort of like a quasi, you know, Al Qaeda type threat. Right. Uh, and it's yeah. not that it's much more. This is like you said. You know, these aren't. This isn't by any means a nihilist. They don't represent the kind of nihilism that 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 that, that one could define with Al Qaeda. This is much more. You know, these are serious players. That mean in a sense that they want to conquer territory and then govern. They're very serious about the governing part of it as well. Not to mention the fact that they're extremely media, media savvy, right? I mean, yeah. In the sense that a lot of what we know in terms of like you were mentioning the HISPA and 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 some of the social services they've been able to implement is vis-a-vis Facebook and 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 just some of the social media that they've uh, been able to utilize. Exactly. And we're talking about a very sophisticated Correct. kind of extremist group here. And moving well beyond what Al Qaeda was ever capable of doing, and they've eclipsed Al Qaeda in terms of you know regional relevance. Right. Uh, but you know, so um, is this a maturation of Al Qaeda, or is this a completely separate, uh, you know, like a separate strain? Well, look, I think the context here is very important. I mean, what the Arab Spring brought with it, you know, in uh, in the, you know. Indirectly, but this is this is ultimately what what happened is we had a massive political vacuum in the Middle East because the old state structures, the old autocratic regimes were being weakened. And, you know, not it was a free for all. And you have a lot of different actors who are trying to fill that political vacuum. But the other part of it, which I think is important, is um, I think it's it is one of the unfortunate the, un- the unfortunate realities or the unfortunate timing of the Arab Spring that it happened during the Obama administration, during, a, during an administration that wanted to disengage as much as possible from the Middle East right. and was itself suffering from its own self-doubt, a kind right. of lack of faith, a loss of faith in America's ability to play a constructive role 
in the Middle East. So I, I've, heard, I've heard you say this uh, in, you know, in terms of characterizing the Obama administration vis-a-vis the Bush administration as being sort of mirror images of one another. And, and, yeah. you know, and that's not, that by no means identical, right? That's completely the opposite approach, uh, exactly. especially when it comes to intervention. Exactly. So take Syria, take Syria, for example. Um, I don't think the rise of ISIS, at least to this extent, was inevitable. And let's not I, I just worry that, you know, sometimes we act as if, you know, we couldn't have helped it or we didn't see it coming. In this particular case, we saw it coming. <laughs> right. You know, and I remember I remember, you know, a, a lot of people in 2012 were, were making this precise warning that. The longer we wait, the more the radicals are going to gain ground. They're going to take advantage of the political vacuum. The moderates are going to be eclipsed, and groups like ISIS are going to come to prominence. So no one, no one in this administration can say that this was a surprise. And that's what makes it, I think, very tragic and depressing, is that it didn't have to be this way, but it mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think if if we had, if there wasn't that political vacuum, and if we intervened. And uh, by that, I mean a kind of limited military intervention similar to Libya, Bosnia or Kosovo, where uh, a focus where where you have airstrikes, the creation of safe zones and a very vigorous effort to support and train mainstream rebel forces in Syria. If we had done that, ISIS would have been around, but it wouldn't have been around the way it is now. So ISIS, ISIS is a real beneficiary of a particular confluence of events and factors. And sometimes I, sometimes, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a fan of counterfactuals and thought experiments. And sometimes I wonder what if we had reversed the order? What if it was Obama who was the president on September 12, 2001, after the attacks of September 11th? Mm. And what if it was Bush who was the president at the start of the Arab spring? Because I think their personalities were, were terrible for the moment they found themselves in. I mean, with 9-11, what was needed was was restraint. We had to be very careful about overreaching and going too far and militarizing our foreign policy and kind of descending into this jingoism and all this. And I think with the Arab Spring, we needed an American president who felt it, who understood what this moment meant, who... And I, I imagine in my kind of alternative universe that for all his faults, George W. Bush would have seen these uprisings and something would have clicked. And he would have understood that history would judge him to a large extent on his response to these historical events that were, you know, that were on par with 1989 or 1945 or, you know, 1848, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Obama didn't grasp the moment. He never, there was never a sense that he felt it. And, you mm. know, it could, I, it could have been quite a bit different, I believe. I think that's a fascinating point. Uh, it really is. Um, really, Shadi, again, so much to unpackage here. And I, I, I mean, I, I, like, I have just every time we talk for about <laughs> three to four minutes, I just have more and more questions. But um, I, I think we'd be remiss not to talk about. Um, you know, we are talking about the Middle East to not talk about Israel-Palestinian issue, uh, because this really remains sort of the open wound, um, you know, in the American, in, in the Arab Muslim psyche. Um, I, you know, I think that that, if anything, that's a good starting point. Why? Why is it? Um, why is it that that's such an open wound? You think? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a I know. good question. <laughs> okay, so look, Israel-Palestine isn't really about Israel-Palestine. Mm, excellent. And I think right. this is what this is what I, I think it's because I, I, I hear this question a lot. You know, people are dying all over the region. Um, I mean, the Syrian regime or for that matter, even the Egyptian regime are more brutal, you know, are more right. brutal to their or own Or like people. you said, what happened on August 14th in, in exactly. Egypt, right? That about massacre. Exactly. We're talking, you know, uh, yeah, thousands of people. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> so if you're looking at it comparatively, I think a lot of Americans might ask, well, why did it seem sometimes that that Muslims seem particularly obsessed with this one issue and, and a little and less the other. So I think part of it is Israel Palestine stands for something mm-hmm. um, beyond the actual territorial conflict. Um, and I think it's a symbol of humiliation and which I think, 
um, you know, we should that that word is is worth is worth talking about more because it's so central to so much of the anger, so much of the political violence that we see in the region and the resort to extremism, and um, it it's like a sore thumb and it, it's it's a symbol of Arab impotence. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not saying that, and I, I'm only saying this from a descriptive standpoint. I'm not saying that this is right or wrong or good or bad, but I think we have to understand the right. mindset. This isn't prescriptive. This Pres- is yeah, prescriptive. descriptive. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the, the the mindset I think is um, that uh, you know, first of all, I think in the minds of a lot of Arabs, Israel represents the West. It represents America. Imperialism. So, Imperialism. So you have this juxtaposition where mm-hmm. Palestinians have the West Bank and Gaza, but not they don't totally have them, obviously. But you know the 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 quality, the standard of living is 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 nothing compared to Israel. You go across the border to Jordan, and it's very striking. And as someone who, you know, when I was living in Jordan, I uh, I crossed over the border and spent some time in Israel. And I mean, it's very striking. I mean, you're you're, oh, yeah. you're moving. It's like a parallel universe. Right. Um, right. So it's so the very fact that Israel there is a constant reminder that Arabs have failed, um, not just in one war after another. I mean, how many wars have the Arabs lost? Right. And let's also remember that one of those wars in 1967 was just so embarrassing and devastating. Um, and it, it was so embarrassing that it only lasted for six days. Six it's days. called the Six Day War. That's right. And the fact that you had Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was supposed to be the lion of the Arab world and yeah. bringing back the past glory, the fact that he was he was cut down to size, I think that that was so difficult for for Arabs to absorb after the expectations had been raised so high. And that's why 1967 is such a crucial moment in the Arab narrative mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in so many different ways, and we can't go into them right now. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I think there's a bigger point here, and it, it doesn't just apply to Israel-Palestine, but even as someone who grew up in the American Muslim community um, – and, uh, and in a fairly, you know, in a relatively, you know, Amer- you know, Americanized family, if you want to call it that. But even in my context, I would often, you'd often hear this just in everyday conversation right. when I, when I would travel in the Middle East, but when I would talk to Muslims throughout the U.S., there, there was a sense of loss right. in the sense that we had been one of the greatest civilizations the world had ever seen. And now we had experienced such a precipitous fall from grace. So I think understanding the fall from grace, and I use that particular phrasing for a reason, because I think that Muslims think that, you know, not that they're the, the, the chosen, you know, but the chosen people or anything, but they're, there's no, a, no, they're certainly, but that, but that Muslims, but that Muslims have many Muslims, I would say Orthodox Muslims believe that Islam is the most perfect of the religions. Right. So that, and, and, and history, up until a certain point, validates, quote-unquote, the pleasure of God, vindicates exactly. the Muslim experience. And then what, is, what, what happens in the last 100 years, you know, certainly, it, you know, very symbolic with the Israeli-Palestinian issue, as you so beautifully sort of articulated and laid out, uh, you know, that all of that plays out. It plays out, you know, in terms of the, the fall from grace, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So the question then, I think, and this becomes so central – to the rise of political Islam in the early 20th century That's right. is that with um, with um, the kind of the twilight of colonialism and um, as the West kept on, you know, kept on making amazing advances. And, you, you know, you have a debate about to what extent Arabs and Muslims should replicate the ways of Europe. You know, there 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 was this this question and it, it's ongoing to this very day. What a why did God allow us to fall from grace or why did God abandon us or why is, why is God no longer with us the way he once was? So I think that if you ask that question, there are a variety of different answers that, that you come to. But I think that very question is at the center, not necessarily explicitly, but implicitly in so many of the conflicts that we're seeing and why religion is so contested. Um, <laughs> and why? No, no, and, and one of the arguments that Islamists make um, is that the only way to recover past glories 
is by regaining the pleasure of God. And the only way to do that is, is by turning back to him. That's right. That's right. Never thought we'd have a political scientist on and, and, and engage in this fascinating <laughs> theosophical, no, theosophical conversation. Uh, and, and now I know what to have you on or, or have you talk about next time you're on. Yeah, um, sure. But, but Shetty, again, so, so just wrapping up, I mean, just given the time, um, you know, where do you – so – what happens now? I mean, you know, as someone else who has, del- you know, has, has dabbled into talking about some of this stuff is someone like Reza Aslan, you know, and, you yeah. know, he very recently, you know, I, I, I saw a video of his where he sort of talked about the fact that we could, we, we could, uh, uh, you know, that we could hold the Obama administration sort of, you know, liable for the fact that we don't, that, 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 that the events of the last few months represent the end of the two states dilution. Um, you know, so what do you see happening really here in, 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 in with regards to this conflict? Because, I mean, at any given moment in history is just sort of is just incidental to what's happening, you know, within the overall narrative that is the same for the last 60 years. So I think we have to ask a very simple question is once let's let's put the, the morality aside and on just pure pragmatics is one state possible. And I would answer that with a definitive no. And I think we have to be very careful about these kind of, you know, how how does that happen? And this is the question that I that I've posed in, in, in some of these debates over the past couple months. I want someone to walk me through how a two, how a one state solution happens, because essentially what you're saying there is that the majority of Israeli Jews Mm -hmm. are going to accept the dismantling of their own state. For many of them, the only state they've ever known, the place that they were born and raised and live. There's no precedent for that in modern history, that a people would self-destruct on purpose or self-dismantle, I should say, on purpose. Like, How does that even happen? Presumably, it would have to be through some kind of referendum where, I don't know, a majority or two-thirds of Israeli citizens would vote to dissolve Israel and join this binational Israel-Palestine collective morphing thing. Right. Um, how does that happen? And I think right. it's also, you know, it's unfair to try to correct one injustice, the, disp- the dispossession of the Palestinian people, with a second injustice, which is denying, in my view, the... the um, the self-determination of of the Jewish people um, that they that you know you're essentially saying you can't have a state, right? Certainly, um, the, certainly, you know, one to two generations of people in that you know in, in in Israel who, like you said, that's the only home, that's the only nation state they've ever known. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if they want to do that, if somehow there's like you know Kumbaya something happens moment. and and they're convinced that they they're like oh yeah let's do this. And yeah. they, they go ahead and do that, then fine. Then, you know, that people can decide what they want to do through the democratic process. But I don't like this idea that our people are essentially implicitly saying that we're going to force yeah. Israelis to accept this new reality. So that's one thing on, on the on the one state solution. The two state solution looks increasingly improbable. Yes, I, I acknowledge that. And, you know, the, the current leadership in Israel um, seems to have its its, you know, very fundamental doubts about the appropriateness of a two-state solution. Certainly, that, that's definitely the case for the more right-wing components of Netanyahu's cabinet. But even Netanyahu has said things that suggest that, you know, he's not sure if he believes in the two-state solution. So um, so that that presents, obviously, a problem. But, right. um, but at the end of the day, if there is a different leadership in Israel, I think the basic contours of a two-state solution are still there. So when people say, well, Yes, the, the expansion of settlements does make things very difficult, but there's nothing, there's nothing technically irreversible about settlements. You can build settlements. You can dismantle them. You can also approach it through mutual land swaps as well. I mean, there's ways, there's ways to get around um, some of those, those deeply problematic issues. Mm-hmm. But, even, but, but I think what's more likely, at least for the foreseeable future, is neither of those options. And what we'll have is a muddling through. We'll yeah. have some variation of the status quo for a very long time. And that long time could be, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, we mm. shouldn't assume that there has to be a solution or there will be a solution one way or the other. There could just be this. 
that we just have this endless, like every couple years there's a renewal of conflict, right. hostilities. Um, and um, it's been going on for a very long time. So who's to say it won't go on for another 50 years? So there is a third option, which is this. Mm, mm. Seems like none of these options are really tenable. Um, <laughs> you know, the other, you know, the other thing, again, we don't have time to really go into, but I mean, I think people should also bear in mind that when we're talking about, you know, who represent, like, who is the voice for the Palestinian people and who represents the interests of the Palestinian people, if it is Hamas, again, I think we need to see Hamas in the context of our larger conversation that we've had for the last, you know, 70, 75 minutes or so with regards to these, you know, an, an Islamist party that is now working with Within the democratic system, you know, and and what does that mean for America or Western interest, where you know the Middle East, you know, doesn't respond to democracy the way we would want them to? So, for example, do we impugn an entire people because they've elected, quote, you know, they, they've elected Hamas as their leader, you know, as, as their leadership? So, I mean, that's a greater conversation to have, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood or whether it's Hamas or whether it's you know a Salafist party somewhere else. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, the rise of Hamas and certainly their electoral victory in 2006 really right. brought those questions to the fore. Again, this dilemma that the U.S. has that right. democracy in theory and practice are two different things. And what do we do about outcomes that are not, in our, not to our liking or not in our interest? I think the question remains in a way what to do about Hamas. Now, one, one possibility is eradication, mm -hmm. but that seems very unlikely, if not impossible. And certainly the Israelis themselves aren't even trying to eradicate Hamas. So if you can't eradicate them and they represent a significant segment of the population, then what does that mean in practice? That means that they're there and you have to find some way to deal with them as a reality on the ground. And that becomes very challenging from a U.S. policy perspective because, first of all, they're obviously designated as a, as a, um, as a terrorist organization – Exactly. Um, and, you know, there, you know, will they ever truly come to terms with a two state solution? That's a big debate on its own about Hamas's uh, Hamas's position on that. Some would say their evolution on that. But I think we have that's something that we have to grapple with. You can't just ignore Hamas and pretend they're not there. They are there. And I think that's why. There was something surreal. There's, there's, there's always been something surreal about the peace process because it doesn't really have an answer to the question of what to do about Hamas. And at some point, so true. And at some point, you can't have a peace settlement unless you address that. So I mean, that's something. Yeah, right. That's a, that's a, that's a tough one. No, exactly. I mean, because every time we, you know, Americans talk about, you know, peace, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, conversation around, around, around finding a solution, it's okay, Mohammed, you know, let, let's call up Mahmoud Abbas again. Well, what does, who does, who does Mahmoud Abbas represent exactly? You know. Yes. So you know, and 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 we're at the same time not, you know, deal with Hamas whatsoever or recognize their, you know, re recognize them as a viable player. Um, Shadi, again, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Uh, I'd like to, again, take the opportunity to really uh, 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 recommend his book, Temptations of Power, Islamist and Illiberal Democracy in a New Middle East. A lot of what we've talked about is, is really uh, delved into much further and obviously, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with a lot more detail. Uh, Shadi, where can people find you, um, you know, online or obviously, uh, you know, reach you or, or check you out? Yeah, sure. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Shadi Hamid, um, S-H-A-D-I-H-A-M-I-D. And um, you can also find my articles and, and writings more generally on my Brookings page. Um, I, I don't have that link memorized, but you can search uh, no, Shadi, was... Ham, Shadi Hamid and Brookings and you'll find you'll find that page. That's so right. Let me, just, let me just take this opportunity to say thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. I'm really happy we did this. I really enjoyed it, and I hope we get a chance to continue it. No, I appreciate that. And I just wanted to also let the listeners know that we'll make sure that we, we, we put up all the relevant links to some of Shadi's fascinating articles, his media appearances of late uh, on our Facebook page. So please go ahead and check those out. Uh, as always, uh, Zaki, uh, tell the good folks where they can find us. Well, you can find the show at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio uh, online. We're at diffusecongruence.podbean.com. And, of course, our Facebook page is facebook.com slash 
Diffused Congruence. Also, if you have any questions or comments, hit us up at diffusedcongruence at gmail.com. Basically, you have every possible way to reach us. So I don't want to hear any excuses about how you don't know how to get in touch with us. That's right. Uh, and I, and I want to also take the, uh, you know, I think take this opportunity to say that I wanted to thank uh, all of the amazing responses that we continue to get. Um, you know, I, I, you know, there, there are, I, I've met people in the last few months who, who continue to, uh, say how they are, how they're listening and enjoy the show, benefit from it. You know, the show wouldn't be anything without you guys continuing to listen. Uh, please do send us feedback though, as Zucky said. Um, please like us. Please, I'm sorry. Please like our Facebook page. Uh, please and like us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the, we need to maybe edit that uh, that, that that desperation out. Um, but uh, and at the same time, leave us a review. We'd love to hear your thoughts. We look forward to hearing from you, and hopefully, you will look forward to hearing from us when we are back with our next episode very shortly. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm. <laughs>